Okay, so we have the second lecture of the day and the last lecture of Patrick. So, Patrick, your time starts now. Time starts now, okay. So, you, uh, you're, this is the last lecture where you have to sit in the front, you know, as, as soon as this afternoon. So you can go back and sit, you know. I mean, you might even be able to go in a different room and listen to this lecture, right? So, this is... Uh, so, um, so, welcome back. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here again. Um, a Ludo. I have your water bottles here. Yes. Okay. So I went more conventional for the decoration today. This is actually where I work. So it's a nice baby. <laughs> so this is this is my office there, and my group's office also. We're all. If you come, if you ever come to visit, you you'll see it's a. It's a nice view from when you look outside the window, mostly. Okay, so let's recap where we were, right? So essentially what we've been doing in the last two lectures, we, we were trying to get, you know, for those who, who were paying some sort of attention, we're trying to get somewhere from, from the infinite dimensional solution that Francesco has presented down to two to three dimensional simple liquids and try to understand what are the hurdles in trying to connect what one sees in infinite dimension and what one can measure or observe in, in physical systems in 3D. And Ludo completed his, his it's okay, you don't have to listen. Ludo just finished his, his set of lectures where he related one part of the phenomenology, right, looking at this configurational entropy and the putative Kaltzmann transition that, that, that accompanies this object in finite dimensions, and uh, uh, you know, in a sense, in a sense, that was the theme of how he did it. How he did it, and, and with all the caveats and uh, with the different variances in configurational entropy, they nonetheless more or less all give the same message at the end. So quantitatively, they don't fully agree, and the notion is somewhat ill-defined. But you don't have to do a large leap of faith to reconcile them, at least qualitatively, and to get them to extrapolate towards the same point. That was the final figure he ended uh, with. Uh, when we're looking at the dynamics, when we're looking at trying to look at how a liquid evolves in 3D and becomes more and more sluggish, the task is a lot more complicated. Actually, I, I want to tell you today, there's not going to be a nice show, you know, reveal at the end where everything works and you're... I, what I'm going to leave you is with a bunch of problems, right? With a bunch of ideas that I hope will be helpful in, in solving this is to reconcile those ideas, but it's a work in progress, and to a large extent, it's a uh, it's an unsolved one. What you know, what we've been doing is looking at different ways in which finite dimensional systems are different, and maybe we can or cannot neglect those features. The one we can most easily neglect is crystal nucleation. That's the one part we, in a sense, we've without resolving that part of the glass problem, we can say that it's something we can confidently neglect in, in most cases. And we've talked about the complexity of structures. Last lecture, we looked mostly at the dynamical criticality, right, and how it, what aspects of it may or may not survive in finite dimensions, and in which ways they would be, sh they would be shaped, right? How essentially the critical regime would be truncated somehow uh, at, some, at some time scales in the best of scenarios. And, on, and then the critical exponents themselves are, are of unknown quantities, right? They're, 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 they're hard to determine in finite dimensions because they're below the upper critical dimension and or because they depend on a complex structure and the dimension. So you know, there's all things coming in. And then what we finished with was a discussion as to one type of processes can actually, you know, one family of, the rest of processes that do kill the criticality, right? Because they truncate the time scale over which the over which the, the relaxation time scale is allowed to grow as a parallel before something else happens, right? Even in the most optimistic scenario, you would be sort of truncated by a, a RFOT like nucleation of a glass to glass inflation. That's more or less what I ended with. Um, but you know, in all those effects have the advantage that if you tune dimension they become smaller, right? They, they sort of less go, they more or less go away. And, you know, sometimes you can try looking for, I mean, and we've used that tools in a sense to identify those, those phenomena as being present and 
to see how they all modulate what's going on. But to, if we want to discriminate between them, it's, it's really challenging. Right? To, because they all grow, the complexity does grow as you decrease dimension. The, 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 the distance away from the upper, uh, the upper critical dimension for the, for the dynamical transition also grows as you lower the dimension. Um, the propensity of nucleation to happen also grows as you lower dimension. So which ones of those three effects is at play is a, is a difficult one to, is a difficult problem to resolve. I wanted to, oh, oh yeah, maybe I should have put this first. Uh, this was my correction from yesterday's class. Uh, um, found, you know, we found another mistake. But, but uh, yeah, this is how you should look at it and just, uh, this is the Franz Parisi potential in the right axis. Okay. Now, what I really finished the lecture with, and I, because I wanted to introduce this model so that when you look at it today, it would look familiar, right? And you'd feel like, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. So, so, because it could, it can look strange at, at, at the start. It's a model called the Marie Kurchan model, uh, and is a brilliant masterstroke of of, uh, of Jorge Kurchan here. Not a paradigm shift, just a, a real masterstroke in, in how we think about glasses. And the interesting part about it is that the reason why I think it's a brilliant masterstroke is not actually the reason why it was invented. Right? The reason why it was invented was because, and, and we will argue a bit this, that, that this is a model, the, the MK model here, that does not have any crystal nucleation, that does not have a complex structure, that doesn't have a finite dimensional criticality, it's, it has mean field criticality, because it doesn't have an RFOT-like nucleation. So, the original motivation for it was, well, one of the original motivations for it is say that you're going to be able to to see the pure dynamical criticality in, in, a, in a model you can simulate, right? And, and it turns out, you know, without burning all my punches, this is not what we're going to see. Instead, what it's going to reveal is another type of activated processes that, that interfere with the dynamical slowdown. Okay, so getting back to what this model is, right? So this is the Hamiltonian of one limit of the Mari, of the Mari Kirchhan uh, model, right? So we have the kinetic energy. These are very simple hard spheres in, in essentially all respects, right? This is the, the microscopic interaction. So these are, you could actually be chosen arbitrarily. I'm going to be talking about hard spheres here because it's an entropy school. Right? And the key difference with the regular hard sphere interaction is that you have this random shift. And those random shifts are chosen box wide in one limit of the, of the model. Right, so you can choose each of the components to lie between zero and the box side of L in each of the D dimensions of the box. This is what this notation means. Uh, you could you could think of writing it slightly differently as you know as a, as being from you know minus L over two to L over two. But D is a completely equivalent sort of shift in periodic boundary conditions. Maybe this notation is a bit more elegant because you can think of taking those two bounds and shrinking them all the way down to zero. And if you do so, you have a pure hard sphere model. You recover the hard sphere model. So one of the reasons why uh, Jorge and Romain Marie were interested in, in, in this is that you could actually interpolate from this fully delocalized interactions all the way to, to, so to hard spheres in something that looks like a continuous way. Right? And, uh, and they're quenched. Well, we'll get back to this in, uh, in a second. But, uh, and, and, and then that would allow you, instead of tuning dimension of space, which I've argued is one way to go to the mean field picture all the way down to, to, to three-dimensional systems, this was a way that was conceived as going also from presumably the mean field picture down to a fully interacting standard system by tuning this range of interaction. Okay, now, what does that mean in practice? And I should say, I stole this picture from, I, there's no attribution, but this is from one of uh, Jorge and Marie and uh, Romain's papers. And so, in a regular hard sphere systems, if you have three particles that are interacting with one another, that is, if one is close to two and one is close to three, then necessarily two is close to three, or with high probability, two is close to three. Right? And this is one of the conditions that disappears as you increase the dimension of space, because you, know, you have so much space around one, that if two is close to one and three is close to one, two and three are 
likely very far from one another. Right? There's just so many other orthogonal directions in which dimensions in which you could uh, you could lie that with very high likelihood, or probably one, they won't be close to one another. Right? But in finite dimensions, in two or three, there's just so little volume that you end up two neighbors are highly likely to be close to one another. Right? But if you introduce this random shift of the particle positions, right, the fact that particle two is shifted so that it interacts with particle one, and particle three is shifted so that it interacts with particle one, does not mean that two and three are close by to one another, because they have their own random shift. Well, first, they could be really far each other. And on top of this, from, from each other, and on top of this, you're adding some other random shift that's be pushing them even further away. Actually, they're arbitrarily equally, uh, equally likely. So the result of this is that if you look at one being close to two, three is just shifted elsewhere in the box. Practically speaking, this is in the spirit of the high dimensional, in the high dimensional um, uh, reality because the fact that the, getting three particles to interact together at once is as a property of it that's vanishingly small. And actually the property vanishes as the size of the system increases. So if you make very small systems, you can still have correlations, but it's very easy to just look at a larger system and, and make all those correlations go away. So as a result of, of that, uh, that happening, right, you can write the pair correlation function as only the first term, as it's been mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the expansion, it's exactly for hard spheres, a theta function. Or in other words, g of r or hard spheres in the Marie Curie model is just this. Right? All this complex structure. You want to get the mic? No, I'd like you to get a mic. <laughs> I can't hear you. Well, that means that the random shifts respect the hardcore exclusion. Yes. Oh. Yes. I mean, there's a natural way in which you do this, right? You can choose a very low density configuration, choose the random shifts, make sure that none of them create an overlap, which in a low density configuration is essentially guaranteed. Then you compress it slowly and you don't create overlaps because you're just running some dynamics, compressing it, then the particles are going to bounce from each other, and there won't be any overlap as you do this. But there's one way in which your comment actually leads to something a bit more profound that we're going to get to in maybe 10 minutes or less. Okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, and, and the equation of state also, beta p over rho, is just 1 plus v2 rho. Right? There's no higher order term as well. So these, these relationships that Francesco you know, motivated in his first lecture are exact for this particular model. Even though we're looking at a three-dimensional system or even a two-dimensional system, this, these relationships remain, you know, remain valid because we've killed higher order structural correlations in the system. And what happened to all the nice chalks? Uh, And it's the exact, actually, that's correct. Uh, it's the exact the same B2 as for hard spheres, as you would have. It's a two body interaction. Okay. Um, now, other reasons why this is great. So, this gets rid of the complex structure. It also removes all notion of interface. Right? You can't subdivide the system in two parts. And the result of you being unable to form an interface means that you can't nucleate. Right, the, class, the, the essential assumption that you're making in a, in a classical nucleation description is that you have to form an, in, an interface between the two different phases. And you can't do that here because there's no real notion of space. Now, the fact that you don't have any real notion of space also means that if you have spatial fluctuations, these don't couple to, to the relaxation. Right? So you don't have... you know. You know, the contribution to RG right, to normal, that, that come from the fact that you're in, in low dimensions is the fact that you have those spatial fluctuations that arise, but you can't have those because you don't really have a notion of, 
of coherent space. Each particle sees a different space around it. So that's what makes this model. You know, so if, if it has if it has some critical points, it's a mean field criticality. So I should write this. So no nucleation possible. Mean field criticality. So it means that if, if Francesco computes some critical exponents in infinite dimension, these are the ones we should be observing here. Right? So it's very, very convenient uh, in terms of uh, from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, another thing that's uh, that's very nice about this model is that if you take the limit of this particular model in the limit where the dimension of space goes to infinity, and right? so if you're making two really arbitrary uh, or seemingly arbitrary decisions, right? Not only do I introduce those random shifts, but on top of this, I take it in the limit of infinite dimension. Well, it turns out that in that limit, the properties of that model provably coincide with that of hard spheres. Right? So the partition function that Francesco computed in the limit of infinite dimension for this model is exactly that, the one that you would see for hard spheres. Right? So it's a pretty, at least it's very controlled in, in, in that particular context. Um, you know, and when I talk about mean field criticality, I mentioned the, you know, so this applies both, and one, sort of, I broke this down, but it's true for gamma, it'd be true for nu, obviously, it'd be true for the square root singularity of the cages. And with one, and one, you know, there's one assumption that we're going to be making in a sense to be able to, to make sense of this or to describe it. Francesco, in the limit of infinite dimension, what he obtained essentially is that the cages that a particle experience are Gaussian in nature. And so because of all those similarities, you might be tempted to say that this particle, this system might also have Gaussian cages in, in low dimensions. And if you make this assumption, this is how you recover the square root singularity approximation. Um, and this turns out to be a bigger assumption that you might assume to begin with. This is sort of what's going to start um, to introduce interesting new physics in this particular model. Okay. So before I, I move any further, looking at the properties of this model, I want to talk about how you go about then simulating. I'm going to make another simulation interlude about how you how you you go and and simulate a, a Marie Kirchhoff model because this the introduction of random shifts does change your life a little bit. Right. What was it? Oh yeah 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 yes for for hard spheres yes. Except if you okay. Except if you create an overlap while while choosing it, which was uh, Francisco's comment. Which is, er, but if if that happens, you just pick one again. So really, it's a it's a flat with a tiny exclusion zone for the lambdas that provide it. Four hard spheres. Yes. Well, and we'll. Okay. Um, so we have two basic simulation tricks when we're looking at, at simulating, uh, simulating uh, any finite dimensional systems. You know, if you look up Frankel and Smith, this is actually from the appendix of Frankel and Smith. There's one method that's boxing space into smaller boxes so that you only look at the nearby interactions. And I mentioned this already when we looked at higher dimensional systems. And I said the problem with higher dimensional systems is that your, your system is so small that you don't have more than three boxes on the side. So you don't gain anything out of boxing your system into smaller cubes when calculating the, the interactions. Now the problem in the Marie Kirchhoff model, you can, you can have large systems, right? You can get systems that are pretty humongous, but there's no notion of space. Right? So you can't really have a set of particles that you know are close back close to one another. So you can't write a, a set of cubes like this. Or if you write a set of cubes, it's a different set of cubes for each particle. So you 
don't gain anything anymore because you have to do n set of cubes and in which you look for those interactions. So this trick here is completely useless. Right? So the algorithm that you're going to be looking at will necessarily be n square scaling. And you know, the only trick, because the only trick you're left with is building a, a fine shell around it, having a, a, a spherical cutoff and keeping a neighbor list, a Verlet list in, in your simulation. So that's one downside, right? It goes like n square. Another important downside is that by killing correlations the way we've done, the result is that we have to look to, for get systems that are dense means that you have many more particles in them. Right? So, many so many particles don't see one another that to get a high enough density that you see some dynamical slowdown, you need to have systems that are larger or are denser than what you would have if you were to look at simple hard spheres. Right? So not only do you have an algorithm that scales like n square, but n is, is larger the, for, for the same volume, say. You'd have to look at an n that's larger than for hard sphere to get comparable tau alpha. So from that standpoint, this doesn't look like a great model, right? Because the price that you're paying in that context. There's, uh, there is, however, one thing that's really, really convenient about it. And it goes back to, and, and it's, uh, it's based on, on, on the following, right? So in general, we can define two types of averages. And this was a discussion that was part of, of, of Ludo's uh, context, right? You can define what's called a, a quenched average, meaning that I average a, a quantity, right, an observable f over all the possible you know, configurations that are consistent with a given Hamiltonian, and then I average over the disorder. That's what you would call a quench averaging. So this is how it's written. So this is the definition of what's my average of f, and then I sum over all possible realizations of, of my quench disorder, which is my random shifts here in the system, right? So, and this is how, if you are to take with a, let's say with a low density configuration and just increase its density, keeping the, the shifts, the random shifts fixed, that's exactly what you're doing in a sense. You could also be thinking of what's called an annealed average, in which case you're averaging both over the positions, say, and their shifts at the same time, and you're normalizing with the corresponding partition function. So it's called F sub A in this particular notation, the annealed average. Now, what's really convenient, and, and, and in this case, you can actually exchange the averaging. You can average over positions first and then average over, over the shifts second or the opposite. Right? They're just completely exchangeable. In, an, in, in a quenched average, this is not the case. Now, what's really convenient about a replica symmetric phase in general, or in this particular case, about the liquid phase of the MK model, is that the two types of averages are equivalent, right? So if you are in a situation where the average of the log of something or uh, the average over the disorder of the log of the partition function or the average of disorder of the partition function logged, and, the, and if, when these are the same, you can, do, you can exchange the order of the averaging. What does that mean practically? It means that if I can, uh, if I can find, so if I, if I have a given realization of the system, a given, a, let's say a given set of positions, if I can find lambdas such that this is a valid configuration, then I have a configuration. I'm done. Right? The, the technical term for this is planting. You'd be doing a, a mean field planting. That's the, that's the joke here. Uh, this is a field that's being planted. Mean field, okay. anyways. Um, so what do you do, right? So the algorithms that you choose points at random, which you can do, right? And these are going to be your particle positions. And then second, you find lambda ij such that uh, the this configuration, though you know one, is an equilibrium configuration. And you're done. 
right? At, and so you're done at any, any density in the replica symmetric phase. Is an equilibrium configuration, which in the case of a hard sphere is an allowed configuration, right? Because these are completely equivalent, right? If I don't create overlap, then it's an, it's an equilibrium configuration. That's the only requirement, right? So, so, so think about this, right? If you're simulating hard spheres, if you've ever done this, you start from a low density hard sphere, someone you know, gave you a configuration or you know, at low density where you generated one, and then you compress it really slowly, right? And as you actually slower than a relaxation time, and this relaxation time is growing, so this gets more and more tedious. You know, you have to follow the equilibration criteria that, that Ludovic was describing. You want to make sure this is all right, and, and then you sweat, you know, and people always ask you, are you sure you're equilibrated? And say, well, I am pretty sure I am. I've, you know, tried all those things. You can never be sure. And you sort of, you, you move your hands, uh, and, you know, he's doing it correctly, but, you know, it's always a recurring question. Here, you don't have to bother, right? You don't need to equilibrate anything. You just choose points at random, and you find, you choose your shifts, right, with this probability distribution, which in the case of hard spheres just means it's, you know, if you translate this, this uh, expression into a hard sphere language, it's just a shift such that no two, new overlap is created between two particles. That would only happen if you think about the, the possible choices of lambda. It would happen only for a very small part of the box volume. So if you happen to create an overlap, just draw another one and you're done. Right, so this is a very convenient model. So you pay in simulation time, but you gain so much in being able to create configurations at equilibrium at no cost, essentially no cost. Okay, so that's one really nice feature about simulating this, this, uh, this model. Um, another thing that's really elegant about this model, and that I'm not going to discuss in great detail, but so this is mean field planting. In the glass phase, So something, a statement roughly equivalent to for, uh, for uh, the packing fraction larger than the dynamical transition. So at the, on the equilibrium glass phase, the, the same branch that Francesco was showing, you can also do, you can do uh, what's called cavity reconstruction. What does that mean, right? It means that I can recreate the environment in which a particle evolves. Right, so if I want to study the property of one particle, I can just recreate its neighborhood, which we know in a glass phase would be static. Right, so you can recreate a valid environment in which this particle would do so. Now, here's a few hints as to why that might be the case. If you think about G of R, right, what is G of R for this, for this system? It's you know, up to the particle diameter, it's, uh, it's empty, right? If you, if you are one particle, you're sitting here at the origin, and you're looking at the environment around you. Right? This is a cavity you're thinking to, to, of reconstructing. So up to sigma, up to your border, there's no other particle. And beyond your border, particles are completely uncorrelated, right? They're ideal gas looking in their distribution. So the cavity reconstruction corresponds to you put a particle at the origin, you exclude any particle from your own volume, but beyond that, you just put particles at random. And if you're at high enough packing fractions or a high enough density, then this will create a cage in which you can evolve. Right? And if so the, 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 the one subtle aspect is that you, you need to give your neighbors also a cage. Right, because they're also shaking. So if your cage is Gaussian, as you can somewhat reasonably assume they are, 
You can give those particles a, a, a Gaussian cage. You can compute what is the Gaussian you evolve in, right, which is constrained by every other particle around you. And then you can do this iteratively up until you find what is the proper distribution of cage size. Right? This is the cavity reconstruction equations that you could, you could write. So again, so you put a particle at the origin, you exclude particles from your nearby environment, you put a random, uh, an ideal gas distribution of neighbors, you assign those neighbors a given cage randomly, then you compute the cage of the central particle as it evolves in the field of the fixed field of those Gaussian cages. So this is a new interaction potential. And you can do this, you know, thousands of times, millions of times necessary to converge the distribution of cage sizes. Yeah. Uh, you may, no, it's not independent of lambda. One thing it does mean is that it's a self-averaging quantity, and that if you take the large system size limit for a given realization of lambda, it's equivalent to averaging over smaller, smaller system size and, and for different lambdas. So it's not independent of lambda per se, but you can self-average the quantity away if you, in the thermodynamic limit. That's one of the meanings of this. Okay. So there's, there's a cost, again, there's a cost to simulating the MK model, but there's two major benefits. Free planting at any density. And Beyond the glass, the dynamical, glass, the, 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 the dynamical transition, you can reconstruct a cavity in which a particle evolves if you make the assumption that the cages are Gaussian, which the infinite dimensional solution suggests is, is a reasonable approximation. Okay, is that, is that clear? So you can sort of see where, what this is, how, why this is a useful model. Now, uh, there's a few plots, there's a few graphs on, on a few curves on this plot. I'm going to just highlight a few of them. Uh, the first one, maybe the easier one, is the one I talked about yesterday, the onset. Right? Where do you start seeing an inflection in the mean square displacement that suggests that things are starting to be a bit slow? I think uh, Ludo called it TO on his latest, in his latest slide. T star. It, I thought it was TO on the last slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was only in our paper, right? Okay. So T star or TO or T on set. Uh, it's, it's a somewhat ill-defined quantity in some, in some ways, at least theoretically ill-defined quantities at this point, but at, at least practically you can measure it. And it's, it seems to be roughly independent of dimension within the scaling, the mean field-like scaling that we discussed yesterday, right? So roughly one yesterday for hard sphere, we had something that was 1.2 with some error bars. Here, I should say this the MK model as a function of dimension. It's roughly one plus some uncertainty in that, that same range. Okay. Now, if you make the assumption that the cages are Gaussian, and you look at the dynamical transition, and I'm going to detail shortly what I mean by making the assumption that the cages are Gaussian, what you do get is that the dynamical transition is at, you know, something like 4.8 And these should start, this number should start to look familiar at this point, right? It looks like phi d is about 4.8 d, 2 to the minus d. Right? That is the asymptotic hard sphere scaling that Francesco obtained in the high dimensional limit for Gaussian cages, which are exact in that limit. And if you, and if you assume cages to be Gaussian, or if you make sure the cages to be are Gaussian, this is also what you get in a finite dimensional version of the system, right? So this is quite remarkable because you're going very, very far from the infinite dimensional limit and the scaling looks remarkably good. Right? Um, there's a few other uh, quantities here and I will get back to those after I show you this next plot, this next view graph. Yep. Did you want to give him the mic? <laughs> Very puzzling thing. If the model for infinite shifts, one can convince oneself that doesn't have either of the transitions, how come for finite shifts, all of, even large ones, all of a sudden we might think that, well, the mode coupling one doesn't exist, but why would the Gaussman transition appear just by the act of going from infinity to something large? Isn't it? Should it indeed be going the other way around, no? 
normally increasing lengths makes transitions that are not and not the contrary. I, I, I'm talking about the Kaltzman transition in this particular uh, yeah. set of lectures. I, I, the, the honest answer is I don't know. Actually, I've never given it any much thought, but Francesco probably has some idea. I mean, we know why Kaltzman disappear in the infinite range limit, but how does it reappear when you make the, the interaction ranges finite? The problem is that if for any, if you put random shifts, you are breaking the, the indistinguishability between particles. So it's becoming, a, like in Ludovic, it's becoming a... Oh, okay, I know. So if you introduce, Even if, if the random shifts are very small... If there's, yeah, if the shift is small, but you can do the swap, right? This condition on, and this condition... Oh, but I think it's really a matter of... I mean, if, if you have random shifts, now the particle, each particle has different random shifts, so you cannot exchange any particle, so you have a log n in the mixing entropy, and then it, the, the configuration entropy is infinite. But it's a kind of... Uh, Pathological behavior of I would actually argue effect. that it probably has to do with something like the mixing entropy instead. And in the infinite shift limit, you can't exchange particles or you can't exchange shifts because then you create overlaps necessarily. But if the shifts have to be really small, I mean, okay. So at, at short range, it, does, it doesn't disappear at zero plus. It disappears slowly as the, you, you can make those swaps appear. Um, mm -hmm. oh, anyways, that's, it's a good question, but uh, we've never thought really deeply about this. So for those who uh, were a bit puzzled by the question, I, and I sort of avoided the question, I thought I was going to be able to avoid the question altogether in this particular model, mm -hmm. which is that I told you you can plant an equilibrium configuration at any density in this model in the infinite range limit. And you should have been... So if you're making the connections with Francesco's lectures, you would have said, well, this is a problem because if I go, uh, if I, if I go to very high density at some point, I should hit a Kaltzman transition. I should not be able to find configurations easily. And so Jorge was asking, well, how does this dynamical, uh, this Kaltzman transition disappears when you have the infinite range uh, swap? Uh, and it's a good question is the answer. And, and one might think that using a, tr a treatment like Ludo did would be the right way to correct, to obtain the proper configurational entropy and, and looking at the mixing. Now, is, is, <clears throat> is there a possibility that the number of ways in which you can plant uh, is changing as you get close to the Kaltzman transition? Is, is there, uh, in other, I mean, is there some kind of a satisfiability question? No, it's always a two-body a two body problem, right? So if you, meaning that you, if you have more particles around, if you have a higher density, when you plant, it's only a question of the two particles you're looking at. So it's always over the box size. Having more particles around does not change the number of available, of available lambdas you could, put, you could use. But independently, it's that they're completely independently chosen variables. So you can repeat this without problem. On average, the particles will always be far apart. Okay. Um, yes, so getting back to what I was talking about. So this is an example of a cavity reconstruction process you would do for one particle. So I've, I have one particle here at the center. I've planted a high density of neighbors around it, right, beyond phi d, or phi d, quote unquote, for this model. And I give, I've given all those particles um, a, a Gaussian cage, right? So they, they're not really fixed in place. They have a, a, a Gaussian cage in which they evolve, which results in them having an effective potential with, with which the central particle can evolve. Right, so I have this field, you know, this surrounding field that the central particle feels, and then I can run a simple, simple Monte Carlo, right, a local Monte Carlo, with just displacements in that field exerted by the neighbors. And if that density of neighbors is high enough, what I get is, you know, the particle will be caged, and I get a cage shape, and it's roughly Gaussian, and calculate its, its width. And if I look, so if I repeat this many, many times, right, this is lambda, here is a, 
uh, sorry, delta here is used as, a, as the, a measure of the width of the cage. I get a distribution of cage sizes that, you know, there's not a single cage size that summarizes everything, but there is some distribution that's pretty universal, actually, in going from one dimension to the next. So it's, a, it's an interesting shape distribution, but you know, for, for, for practical purposes, you can say, well, this is just a, a distribution period. Right? And I can compute this, and therefore, if I, if, I have, if I pick a cage size from this distribution to give it to the neighboring particles, and then I evolve the central particle within it, then I'm just sampling the equilibrium states of, of the particular particle in the system. It, it has a fat tail. Yes. W what exactly is a cage? Actually, there's no theory yet as to what this cage should be. This cage size distribution should be. Mm -hmm. sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, I can tell you empirically this is what we observe, right? If you go four decades below, is it still going to be exponential? I don't have, there's no theoretical support for what this cage size distribution should, a cage, uh, yeah, cage size distribution should be. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's fatter than Gaussian, but that's, okay. So that's, so we can compute this. Another nice quantity we can look at is the average cage diameter, right? Francisco has argued uh, already two days ago, I think, that the that the cage size diameter, the, the cage diameter should uh, grow as you approach a dynamical transition from above as a, as a square root, right, up to some, some finite value. And the square root, these are square root, these are the proper scaling forms. I can, you know, the, the, the theoretical prediction and what we measure in, uh, in the simulations from the cavity of construction, right, and we do get reasonably good uh, square root like singularities at the distribution. With one caveat, with the assumption that the cages are Gaussian. And I've been repeating this all along because it's a really important assumption that you make or you have to make to be able to get those results. Because it turns out that when you try to reconstruct some cages, right, this is another instance of a cage reconstruction. Again, I have a particle in the middle. I've distributed neighbors around it, and they all have cages plucked from some distribution that I think is a good approximation of what it should be. Well, there's a number of instances where the central particle, after you've planted or reconstructed the cavity, the central particle can escape. This cage is not tight. This cage is not closed. There's, there's ways out of it. Right? We're above of this putative phi d, this is a high enough density, but somehow there's some realizations of the local environment that breaks completely the Gaussian cage approximation. Right? And you can find a pathway out. Is this a problematic in general? No. It's not problematic in general in the sense that if you go to high dimensions, you get such a high intensity of neighbors around you that the probability that there'd be a cage with defects goes to zero, right? So the infinite dimensional limit is still correct and you still approach the, the Francesco's result without any concern. But if you look at a finite dimensional, let's say 2D or 3D, well, there are some cages that are not tight with finite probability, right? So this Gaussian approximation completely breaks down in that particular case and it, you could say, well, maybe if I use a, a cage that's just a bit larger, maybe some Gaussian or maybe two Gaussians, maybe it's just going from one point here to another point and you know, it hops back and forth between the two. And that you can imagine this is a small correction. And you could do this. The problem is that this would not solve your problem. Because even if you consider two cages, you would still find configurations in which the particle would find a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one and actually an infinite number of them. Because there exists path, there, there exists realization of the neighborhoods for which a central particle is in a cavity that actually percolates to infinity. It's what type of percolation that is known as void percolation. Right? So there's an empty space or essentially a, fr a essentially free path from the center to the end of the world.
I, yes. I'm just getting a bit lost. Uh, so if if I if I thought of this as like uh, so this cage size, if I did, did use simple minded free volume calculation would go as uh, you're, you're stick on the on on the cage size distribution. Yeah. No. No. The the, no. the, the dependence here. The, the the one, distribution. Okay. Panel D. So how how will it scale? I mean, I guess you can't plot it with respect to P, but P minus PJ or something, right? So this is not this is not jamming, right? This is this is the dynamical transition. This is phi minus phi MCT. This is actually the MCT prediction as well for how there would be a scaling. Right? This is uh, just to make sure I don't mess up when I write it down. This is the expression I wrote yesterday. Right, the 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 average diameter for phi larger than phi d, right, which is when this quant or the plateau height of the mean square displacement, if you prefer, right, it's a, a similar, it's linearly related to it. This would go like phi minus phi d to the power one half. That's a mean field prediction. That's a mode coupling trans uh, prediction. Right, they both. I agree on this particular point. And this is what I'm plotting here. Right, this is, at phi d, the cages disappear. They become unstable. You can't do a cavity reconstruction absolutely below phi d because there's essentially no realization of disorder, or very few realizations of, of disorder that will cage one particle. Most, the vast majority of them will allow the particle to leave. This is why you have this, const this constraint on cavity reconstruction with respect to phi versus phi. Now, to get the nice results, to get the nice scaling I was showing you in the previous plot, what I need to do, right, when I reconstruct the cavity, is I look at all the trajectories that of the particle that just moves a bit too far. And I say, ah, these are probably problematic cavities. So if I throw them all away systematically, I recover the good scaling for phi d, I recover the nice scaling for the average cage diameter. I recover um, you know, everything that, uh, that's elegant about the mean field, uh, uh, mean field uh, prediction in, in, in the field dimension. Yep. Sorry, we, what are you looking at? Right to the right. This one, yep. yeah. Um, therefore, higher or lower dimension than the squares point, for example. Uh, for example, the squares in this in this graph are for low, lower dimension or higher than the triangles. I don't. Yeah. It's a, the page reference is twenty fourteen. And okay. Oh, it's, no, the, but for this one here. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So you think it's the same convention? Uh, it's probably true, actually. Probably. So okay. this, uh, the blue would be two uh, D, and then this. No, but there's no square. No, they're, they're, the colors are different, but maybe. So I I I I I don't remember is okay. the answer because I wanted to know if and we didn't think it mattered much because it really just collapsed on top of each other. Ah okay no it looked like to me that the squares are really tight and then they start to assume a fat tail with the, for example the circles and the triangles start there to and maybe the fat tails are associated with the fact that once you even if it's not that probable once you're out of the cage the distance where you can go. Farther, it's not that. You stop you. I think you're reading signal into noise. Okay. Sorry. But that, that's really what the differences that you could be seeing are essentially just that. I apologize for the noisy data in that context. Uh, okay. So that's, so this is really beautiful, right? This is why I think this was a genius master stroke to formulate this model. Because we started with a model where we thought we were going to get a really Beautiful or boring, depending on your point of view, uh, you know, mean field and infinite dimensional criticality in uh, something you can simulate on your computer. Right? Because we've killed nucleations, because we've killed fluctuations, because we've killed all structure. And what we find instead is a new family of processes that allow to truncate the dynamical transition. Right? These, these events that allow cage a particle to leave. I mean, to be honest, we didn't discover them. If you look in the literature, people have been talking about this sort of processes in glasses for about 30 years. 
They call them hopping processes, right? Then there's, and, and, and when, when this, this community of people, so you look at simulations and there's people who try to design algorithms to identify is this hopping. And the response that everyone, say, in the, in the community that, that came with the mean field bias is, well, no, 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 these are not hopping processes. These are, you know, these are dynamical heterogeneity. These are, um, uh, these are nucleation events, right? These are something else. There's no such thing as hopping processes. Right? They're, they're, they're just, it's your eye misleading you into thinking that these are hopping. They're just a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But now we have a model where we can very unambiguously, where we, we can definitely tell what is the mean field behavior and what is the assumption that's breaking down when you're looking at a low-dimensional system? And you could say this model is pathologic in a number of reasons, right? It doesn't have phi k. It also has this re-random structure, right? Where we've killed all the correlation. So maybe this model even has more hopping than a natural novel that a, a, any regular structural liquid would have because uh, a structural liquid, right, has a G of R that looks like this in 3D. So you have more nearest neighbors that are forming a tighter shell than, than an ideal gas can do. Right? So maybe there's more hopping events, but the advantage of this model is that we can study them separately, very cleanly, without any interference. We can see how important they are, what sort of scaling they have, and what, you know, what sort of physics, or how they perturb the dynamical transition right? uniquely. And it's very elegant because when I talked, to, when I started the first lecture, I said, well, there's some activated processes for which we have theories, and there's activated processes for which we don't really even know how to describe them. And this is one of them. And this is a process that essentially there's no theory for. There's lots of observations that are phenomenological in some ways, but now we can have a model that's clean enough that maybe we can develop a theory for it. Okay, so if I, maybe if I, um, if I summarize what, I, what we see in terms of the behavior of this particular model. So this is a plot that's looking at tau versus the packing fraction. And A here is, um, is a measure of uh, the average case, cage size, say. Okay, so there, I'm looking at two different observables as function of packing fraction. So let's start with the, the one on top, right? So... This is the liquid regime at low packing fractions. This is, I think, for a, a three-dimensional system. And if you had a dynamical transition, if everything were Gaussian and you'd have a dynamical transition, this would be this red line here, this red dashed line. This is where everything would become arrested. Right? And we, this is what we see if we kill non-Gaussian processes from the relaxation. If you keep those Gaussian processes in, you know, what you, you, you go through this putative dynamical rest and essentially unimpeded. And you, I mean, the slowdown does appear, but you don't, you don't see this particular dynamical transition. And, you know, it, it keeps up. If you try to do an MCT fit, if you didn't know about the prediction, if you do an MCT fit, you'd get some effective phi d, phi d tilde, right, that you'd say is, you know, this is what you do every day, right? You look at your dynamical data and you say, I try to fit this, so there's some gamma and some phi d. Well, this is what you would extract in the parallel-like regime. You know, you can do your simulations beyond it and extract relaxation times. If you do a, a Volger a VFT, Volger Folger, Folger uh, Taman uh, fit, this is the green line, you, you fit the data a bit better, right? Then you, you say, well, you know, I, I have some, the, the naive interpretation say, well, I have an MCT-like regime or, a, you know, a, a mean field-like regime, then I have those corrections that are due to nucleation. Uh, that come from the random first order transition theory or description of nucleation, and then uh, and, and then so it's normal that I could fit further away. But it's wrong. It's completely wrong, right? Because the dynamical transition is here because there's no nucleation event, and because the nucle the, the configurational entropy never goes to zero in this particular model, right? So. Uh, you can do those fits, and if you don't have any, if you don't know anything else about this model, you would be doing what everyone else has been doing for fitting glass results for a long time, except that here you would be really, really wrong. Okay. 
Now, what that, if you look then what happens in the, in, the, in, in the sort of cage size or cage structure, if you go to very high packing fraction, right, it means that you have a very large number of points that are distributed at random around you, you do get uh, something that looks like a very nightly tight cage. Right? But as you decrease, so if you go very, very high in packing fractions, this Gaussian cage approximation becomes better and better. As you lower density, however, you start finding paths out. So you can be able to go from one cage to another and maybe back and forth. Right? You get small cage structures with different sites. And then if you go too low in packing impressions, then you start having actually an entire network of those cages that's percolating. You are in a void percolation regime. And when you go, and the, so the red curve is the cage you would get with a Gaussian approximation. The blue curve is what you really observe. So the volume of that blue curve really diverges at the percolation transition, which in, for this particular realization, or this particular model in 3D is much, much higher than the whole transition. Right? The, the real confinement would happen here. Not really, right? So yes and no. So if your obstacles were just fixed points, it would be the free volume. But because those obstacles also are shaking a bit, so they have a Gaussian cage, it's a, they exert a field in which a central particle evolves. And therefore, it's not really the free volume. It's some effective free volume. within some threshold of energy, right, of that field, yes. Or, I mean, in this particular case, we defined it in a, in a, in a sharp way by assuming, if you don't assume that a cage is Gaussian, but a cage has a different form, you, you can find a hard, you can define a hard barrier somewhere. But is it, so the precise position, okay, so the point you raise up is that the, the precise position of this percolation transition define, it depends a lot on what you decide to be the, the threshold for a particle being able to leave its cage. If you take it higher or lower, you can move it. But the, so we chose one that we thought was convenient. It may or may not capture the relevant physics at that particular point. But the, the truth is that if you, it's somewhere in this regime, that there'd be, it'd be really facile for particles to just move far away with very minimal activation. If, I, if I'm thinking, uh, in, in a three-dimensional system mm -hmm. for a change. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, this is a fair game. You can even do two. So, the, so I shouldn't be thinking about the dynamical version of the free volume that you mentioned as percolating through the system, but through some sort of glass minimum, right? I mean, this, this is what, what... So that's what I'm trying to clarify. No, it, it's percolating through the system. System. Through the system. There's really, you know, and, and this is a great lead question to the next slide, actually. Is that, so the answer is that we don't have yet the good theory of hopping in the MK model. It looks really simple, but it's already pretty hard. So we're going to look at a simpler model that's more along the lines of what you want to be thinking about, you know, to try to get a mental picture. Uh, and... It would be to, instead of assuming that your obstacles are, are themselves moving and have some effective field, let's just put them in place. Let's leave them stick. And I, and I saw there was a, there's a poster out there about the, the Lawrence lattice gas, or the lattice Lawrence gas, as it's also known. So what you get if you fix the obstacles in place randomly, it's called the random Lawrence gas. And instead of having a, a periodic versions of it, which is how actually Lawrence initially formulated. People have been studying a, a variance of this model. What if you put the obstacles at random in precisely this ideal gas-like sense, right? You have a Poisson, what's called a Poisson process. You know, they're uniformly distributed throughout all space, the possible obstacles. And now the mapping to go from the MK model to this frozen obstacle, that you can think of the MK models where you have particles of, of a fixed diameter that are pinned around you and the central particle that has a diameter? Well, this is exactly the same problem as if I take, if I shrink the central particle to a point and I double the diameter of the obstacles. Right? Or actually, if I make the obstacles just points and I double the volume of the, of the, uh, of the central particle. 
It's, it's all completely equivalent. It's a question of what you define the length to be, but they're the same problems. Right? So if I fix the obstacle, if I look at a transport of this central one and I move away, it's the same as looking at this bigger one with the, the nails pinned around it. Okay. And that's actually the, the more traditional version of the, of the, the random Lorentz gas. So these are examples. Actually, oh, so I forgot to put the references. This is from uh, Franoche at, at Coworkers 2008, right, where you look at the trajectory of a single such particle, a single tracer, where they actually, they, I think in this case, they look at a point instead of randomly distributed particles and you see uh, randomly distributed obstacles and you just evolve uh, molecular dynamics. Right? You bounce back and forth throughout the system and you just zoom in on the trajectory. And if you zoom out and look at the trajectory from further apart, so the different colors here denote different clusters, different sets of connected points. So each one of those you know, smaller parts here, this would be maybe the cage of a given particle, right? But there's a path out that leads you to another cage, and then you can do a lot of those cages, and that sometimes it's not always obvious to define what's a cage and what's just a path moving out, right? So there's a mix of the two. But there's a, you know, a really large set of the volume you can go at. So this is not a system that's percolating because there's separate zones where you can... Uh, when, when a tracer could evolve. But as you get cl closer to the percolation transition, you would be you know, exploring a larger and larger fraction of space before you can escape. Why? I argued matches to phi D, where the void percolation stops, what you get... Um, you know, this is the mean square displacement as function of time for, actually, all, oh, here I got the references of French and all 2008, right? If you are um, below the percolation threshold, right, so if you have a low density of obstacles, then you have some ballistic behavior at short times, and then you diffuse at long times. As you increase the density of obstacles, you decrease the diffusivity up until you hit some caging limit, and then if you go well beyond that caging limit, so if you go beyond the percolation transition, you, uh, you reach a, a cage size that shrinks steadily beyond it. Right? That's the one thing that's very different with respect to the mean field description is that instead of having a, a flat plateau here, you have a subdiffusive plateau, which is a, some, some diffusion exponent, so it scales like some power of, of um, some, some power of T. And so it's not exactly the same, right? I've killed something along the way, at least in finite dimension, I don't... But if I have processes like these happening, maybe they're mixing in with the cages. Maybe what I see is not really a subdiffusion plateau, but some, just the mean square displacement is not perfectly flat. Maybe there's 1% of the particles that are you know, making it tilt a bit, then maybe you're not noticing it numerically because you're not looking for it, because it's hard to measure, because, because, right? Because you're never really in the glass phase at equilibrium either, so you wouldn't be paying much attention to that. You'd call this aging, maybe. Right? And this is some sort of aging, but it's a different type of aging than the nucleation description that we had. Uh, here, I mean, I mean, here you have a percolating path. So yes, you have different. The, cav the cavities are different, and they're, it's fractal in overall in nature. I mean, there's, I'm, I don't intend to make this a review of, of percolation, which is a interesting topic in its own right. But you know, there's that's that's what we know. And one thing that's very elegant about percolation problems and void percolation in particular is that you can. If you can compute what is the percolation transition through a completely separate algorithm. You don't have to run the dynamics. There's a static definition of what the transition would be. In the case of a, a void overnight percolation, the algorithm is as follows. As in, sorry, in the case of a void percolation, the algorithm is as follows. So you, you put your points at random. You draw the Voronoi cells for each of those points. So you have a Voronoi tessellation of space. Then you put your particles with a finite diameter on top of them. And all the edges that are partially covered by spheres, you remove them. This means there's no particle that could pass in between 
those two. And what's left as a network behind it is uh, you check whether it percolates or not. You have a different density. Yeah, so Sorry. it's different densities of obstacles, or if you prefer different size of those obstacles. You can, as I here, I was arguing that you can rescale it depending on depending on what you call size. And, and in the intensity of some process, you can go yeah. back and forth. Yeah, but then what, you mentioned something like aging. In what sense do you mean that? Oh, what I was saying, no, so I was talking about if you're doing real simulations of, let's say, hard spheres in 3D, and you look at the mean square displacement, you know, honestly, it'll never be perfectly flat. Well, I mean, if you go, if, if you quench your glass to really low temperature, but if you're at equilibrium, the, you get plateau that's a few decades long, maybe, and you say, well, it looks flat enough. But if there were a, a small process on top of it, you would not notice it. Right? It, it could be tilting at the tiny... No, no, what I said is that you could interpret this, this small sloping saying, well, my, perf my system is not perfectly at equilibrium, there's some aging, this is why the plateau is not perfectly straight. And you, there would be the, some interpretation, this is what you might write on paper, and say, well, maybe, maybe there's actually some more complex hopping processes happening. That, and maybe there's, some, there's probably not a percolating path, because that's really a big gap when you have something that has a, a thick shell structure. So maybe there are some of those processes that are happening that are allowing the relaxation to happen. Okay. Um, now it turns out this problem is already too hard to study systematically. Um, as to, the, to, to be fair, we're working on it, but we don't have a solution yet, or another satisfying solution yet. The, the, the random Lorentz gas percolation and the limit of, you know, look at the dy a, a theory for the dynamics and so you can measure those, you can do simulations, you can get those exponents, uh, but to get a theory for those exponents and, and you know, above the upper critical dimension, for instance, there's no, there's no theory, no reasonably good theory for, for, for that particular aspect. Right? And something that we'd like to figure out. But there's, there's, a, you know, there's yet simpler version of that model that one can think of. Right? If you can solve it in real space, then maybe you can solve it on a lattice. And this is the equivalent problem of the random Lorentz gas on a lattice. So you have a, a square lattice, say, where you can, you can have uh, sites that are occupied or not. And there's a percolation transition. It's around here, at about in 2D, I think it's about 59% uh, of the coverage. And the game now is to put an ant that would sit in one of those sites, and you have the ant walk randomly around. And the name is not, or the idea is not mine. The original proposal for looking at an ant evolving in this labyrinth is from De Jain in the 70s. Right? Uh, the ant is mine. Um, but you, so you can do this, and if you were to put an ant here in, at any site, it would always remain caged. It wouldn't be able to escape the cluster in which it is. If you were to put it here, it would be able to diffuse at very long times, and in between the two, you would find a subdiffusive regime. Right? At the perturbation transition, there'd be a really long subdiffusive regime. This is numerical results for work that's upcoming, right? You get, uh, so this is the diffusion here, the caging, the subdiffusion, and you can see in three, four, five, and six dimensions, you know, qualitatively, it's always the same behavior that's happening uh, in this sense. Now, what's interesting about this particular model is that we know from all the theoretical work that's been done is what should be the mean field critical exponent for the cage. Right, so we know what this, this subdiffuse upscaling should be. In 6D, we know that this critical exponent, so 1 over z, would be 0. If you naively think about what that means, that this subdiffusion exponent would tell you that you have some well-formed cage. Or not quite. Right? If it were really 0 with no other correction, then you would have a, a perfectly, you know, something that's a constant of time. But really what happens when 1 over z is 0 is that there's a logarithmic correction that emerges, that you can see. And you can see it in 6 and 7, even numerically. 
Now you can ask, well, okay, so I've got this caging plateau. Is this an important plateau? Or does this disappear in the limit of infinite dimension? Is this one way in which you could recover maybe perfect caging in that limit? And it turns out that the logarithmic correction survives all the way to infinite dimension, this particular model. So this model never has perfect caging, but it has you know, the prefactor for the logarithm, logarithmic which does shrink with dimension, and it gets to be um, pretty slow. So could this be a correction? Or is this the sort of correction that maybe one could look into the mean field description for finite dimensions? Maybe. Because maybe something like this is happening in the MK model, and the MK model has gone rid of everything else. And you would have no way of looking or finding or identifying such correction if you're not guided by the fact uh, by, by that model. So that's why I think it's a really, really important model, because it may teach us about a new type of activated processes that we couldn't conceive of, we couldn't formalize, and that now we're in growing theoretical control, and then maybe eventually even numerical control as well. Okay, so this brings, back, uh, this brings us back to, uh, to, our, to our table. Um, the MK, the Mary Kirshan model in D equals three, has no crystal nucleation, no complex structure, is not below the upper curvature emission, doesn't have R14 nucleation, it does have humping. And I wrote here, it has some facilitation. This is a partially provocative statement. Right? Here's the sense in which it could have facilitation. By facilitation, we mean that one maybe hopping event facilitates that of another. Right? So each particle has a separate environment, but what if, you know, I have a particle here that's, that has this sort of cage, and this particle here is self, you know, we know as this one is neighbor, but it has a, an entirely different set of neighbors around it. Right? So what if this particle is not well caged, it might be able to leave. And then the central one would have a hole in its caging, right? So it requires, so a, a cage is just at the limit of being stable and losing one neighbor because it is itself unstable. That can happen, right? It's rare because we've removed all correlations, but it, it can happen to some degree. So I have this particle that facilitates the displacement of that one. I would argue this is the first model that suggests a microscopic, how the microscopic emergence of facilitation in glass relaxation might emerge. We don't know how significant that is in real glasses. We don't even know how significant that is beyond so numerical observations. Right? But if we have a good theory for the hopping events, we might be able to get a good microscopic theory also for the facilitation events, right? which would be a way of could be a really interesting way, a really interesting twist, if you want, on the theory of glasses, because it would bring back into the mean field control a phenomenon that had been separately theorized and separately explored in a variety of models for a few decades. So that's, that's quite an exciting future prospect. Now, I also want to end with a, a, an important word of caution in this particular part of the discussion, which is that we discovered a new activated process. We don't know that there are no others. Right? We've known about glass, glass nucleation, uh, or RFOT nucleation style, for decades. People had thought about hopping, but you know, it was debated what exactly it was, but now we have a, a way of single it out and to study it separately. What else have we missed? Right? What other new processes? And this can only come out of you know, testing and probing those difficult situations of, well, how does it go from high dimensions to low dimensions? How does it work if you, you know, it's from this careful interpolation that you uncover those, those gold nuggets of new insight. And I don't think this table is necessarily exhaustive. I would love for this table not to be exhaustive, honestly. I just don't know what other columns to add at this point. And the onus is on, is on you to do good work so that you could convincingly show the rest of the world that there are other processes that people have been neglecting. 
Now, the wrong way to go, to go about this is to see whatever you see and then say, well, that's different. The right way to go about this is to eliminate all other possibilities, however cleverly you can. And what's left is that really interesting, you think that the theorists and that the you know, previous uh, scientists who came before you did not think about because you're more clever. What? Sure, sure. Like, well, so, I mean, this is, and this is how we're going to crack the glass problem ultimately. Not by arguing endlessly about things that no one studies carefully, but by being able to, to peel this onion layer by layer and every time finding something new and fresh. So I, I could talk some more, but I don't think it's worth it. So I'm just going to end here and thank you very much for your time and attention. So thanks, Patrick, for the three lectures. Uh, questions, if there be any? Everybody understood everything. Such a nice so teacher. So clear. <laughs> no one wants to talk to me outside of class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Probably since you mentioned this aging, uh, when do you see, let's say, the, the shell, the or feeling the shell of aging, introducing real uh, Aging, which is probably the most uh, significant fingerprint of glass, glass system. Um, I mean, understanding those activated processes and their time scales is what allows you to understand aging, right? What, what happens, what, what is happening between in the aging, right? You're, you're changing basin or you're partially relaxing in some ways, right? If you don't understand those processes at equilibrium, it gets even harder to understand them out of equilibrium. Depends when you measure it, mm -hmm. the process is non-stationary, non-stationarity, how to put it in, in your model, that's probably the question. Or here, do you want to say something? Oh, no, so you thought you were moving your... Uh, as a, I mean, uh, my, my response remains the same, I apologize for... But essentially, you need to understand what are those microscopic processes that, that allow the system to relax and to understand which ones of them you're truncating by going at a certain time scale and you're cooling and you're not allowing them to proceed. And this is, these are the ones that will be aging in your glass if you wait long and longer time. Now, I'm arguing we don't even have, a, we, we have a relatively poor understanding of finite dimensional RFOT nucleation overall, and we have an even poor understanding of hopping in any dimension. So how do you want to, to get to the state where you want me to explain aging beyond that would is, is still a ways off because we we don't have when uh, I'll give us two years <laughs> next election essentially 930 tonight so it's your last chance if you have questions you want to chat with me now is the time after that I'm on a plane for a long long time